Welcome to Louisiana Lefty, a podcast about politics and community in Louisiana, where we make the case that the health of the state requires a strong progressive movement fueled by the critical work of organizing on the ground. Our goal is to democratize information, demystify party politics, and empower you to join the mission because victory for Louisiana requires you. I'm your host, Linda Woolard. On this episode, I have a delightful conversation with Louisiana author Sam Spitali about his brand new illustrated guidebook, How to Fight the War on Truth. We talk through his multi-year quest to weave together a primer that ranges from deadly serious to whimsical on politics, history, psychology, the forces of power, and media literacy to create a roadmap for Americans to become better informed voters and better equipped purveyors of truth. Be sure to check out the links in our episode notes for where to buy the book and get more information. Sam Spitali, thank you so much for joining me on Louisiana Lefty today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. We are here to talk about your new book, How to Win the War on Truth. But I always start the podcast with how I met my guest. And we met on Instagram through, we did. I guess, a mutual friend, Dylan mm-hmm. Field Turner, who knows you from your hometown, I meet Louisiana. Yep. And that's where our governor is from, by the way, our current governor. And apparently, according to Dylan, your grandfather owned an oyster bar and was a great boogie woogie piano player. Uh, yeah, he, um, I, what, yeah. So Spitali's Oysters, uh, yeah, was a bar I kind of grew up in. My grandpa, my great, guess my great grandpa maybe, uh, started it. And then, uh, I guess the last owner was my uncle Guy who did play the piano and actually, uh, cut an album or two way back in the day. So yeah, though now it's, uh, the building's still there, but I'm not sure what it is anymore, but. Yeah, Spitali's uh, bar. bar yeah. Well, what's your origin story with how you ended up where you are today writing a book on winning the war on truth? So my political origin, uh, yeah, is probably not very typical of most people back home. So I've always been a registered independent. When I was 18, I did not know the difference between a Republican and Democrat. So I checked independent and I actually did not learn the difference for at least 10 years after that. Growing up, I was more politically averse, but I was intellectually curious about the world. And so I always read a ton of books. Uh, I worked in a library, you know, growing up, my first job. I always read as an adult a ton of psychology, neuroscience, socioeconomics, inequality, you know, all stuff like that. And I still read a ton. So by the time I took an interest in politics as an adult and began to understand the difference between the two parties, I was a little dumbfounded to learn that they were not two equal groups arguing about the best way to solve society problems. One group seemed to be proposing solutions based on science and data and dealing with real world problems. And then the other group was coming from a place of belief about how they think the world works or how they want the world to work or how it should work. So essentially denying there was a problem (laughs) like global warming are trying to keep a problem from getting solved, like rising healthcare costs, or solving problems that didn't exist, like voter fraud. So when you you read as much as I do, I feel like there's very little disagreement among experts in a given field. You know, there's just science. And for the most part, most of them agree that we have this problem or that problem. You know, the debate should really be in how to solve stuff. But when that information leaves academia, and it enters the public sphere, science meets resistance. So suddenly these facts, these these established facts are now contested or denied and they become partisan. Um, And why is there resistance to facts? Because it threatens someone's business interests or political power. Like the fact that cigarettes cause cancer or burning fossil fuels causes global warming. You know, there's no disagreement among scientists and there never was. It was the tobacco industry scientists that discovered the link between cigarettes and cancer. And it was the oil company scientists who discovered that they were causing global warming. There was no disagreement. There's only the illusion of disagreement 
financed by the oil and gas industry or big tobacco. Um, and it was even the same public relations companies that sowed that confusion. So without having been raised in either political tribe, my parents were, you know, weren't very political either. Um, I wasn't partial to either party, which I felt like made it pretty easy to cast a critical eye on both without any of those tribal tendencies getting in the way. Um, and then I came to understand that, you know, many of those political beliefs that we grew up with in the South and you know, most of the country, like tax cuts, stimulating the economy or welfare queens mooching off the system, you know, most of that stuff originated from one side of the political spectrum. And in South Louisiana, where I grew up, you know, these myths just pervade the landscape. They're not political myths, they're just cultural myths. You know, the line between politics, culture, religion is just so blurred. Um, and so I think uh, relocating to California after college helped me see past a lot of these beliefs for what they are, um, as they don't have quite the same cultural hold on the West Coast. Um, so I feel like a lot of these beliefs are like believing in Santa Claus. You know, once you understand, who creates that belief and what purpose it serves, you never go back to believing in Santa. You know, these myths uh, lose their power. So as I grew out of believing a lot of these things, I guess I kind of expected other people to do so too, you know, as they become an adult, see the world, understand, you know, things aren't like, you know, we're often uh, raised to believe. Um, you know, so many friends and family back home never grew out of these beliefs. Um, so over the years, I kind of became fascinated with understanding not only why we hold so many of these beliefs that are not true, um, but who sold us these beliefs in the first place, you know, who benefits by us believing them. And traditionally, that's been the political right. Um, and, you know, my view of politics, I, I guess, is kind of academic. Like, what I think a lot of people don't understand is that the entire left-right orientation dates back, you know, to the French Revolution when King Louis the 16th called a meeting to handle the country's fiscal crisis. All the power brokers and moneyed interests who agreed with the king assembled to his right, and then the lower and middle-class laborers who disagreed with the monarchy assembled to his left. And so that division between left and right is virtually the same today. So uh, these myths or propaganda, you know, come from the powerful who are traditionally on the right. And that started with the Catholic Church, who coined the term propaganda, which literally means spreading the faith, um, not spreading the truth or spreading facts, but spreading things they want us to take on faith. And that's because at the time the church was trying to fight something that threatened its power, which was Protestantism. And over time, that right wing power structure gave way to monarchies and aristocracies. And during the Middle Ages, when the merchants and craftspeople began climbing the rungs of society, um, from lower class to a middle class, that same power structure felt threatened. So what did they do? They created corporations as a way to control the growing middle class and maintain their power, which leads us to today. You know, the right wing is the ruling class of corporations and the billionaires who control them, or in the simplest of terms, the 1%. And the left wing is traditionally comprised of the poor and the rest of the workforce, or the 99%. And if you look at their voting records or policies, regardless of what they claim, they align exactly like that. You know, a policy either benefits one group or the other. The laborer gets a wage increase or the corporation gets to hoard more wealth. Um, you know, each policy decision can benefit only the 1% or the 99%. You know, who benefits by universal health care? The 99%. Who benefits mm -hmm. by for-profit health care? The 1%. Um, you know, the same with student loan debt. Who benefits by forgiving student loan debt? The 99%. Um, uh, who benefits by burdening students with debt, only the financiers and the financial interests. So the reason we don't think of this, you know, most people don't think of the left and right this way today is a testament to me of how successful the forces of power have been in shaping public opinion, selling the public the point of view of the 1% in order to defeat the 99%. And this looks like, you know, all the stuff we currently identify with politics, identity politics, anti-government sentiment, racial resentment, welfare myths, you know, literally anything that keeps the 99% fighting each other so that the anger is not directed towards the power class that deserve it. And so the yeah. only people who really benefit by right wing politics is the oligarchy, corporatocracy. They are literally the only ones. And I still believe that the main reason the general public 
doesn't see things this way is because we are so indoctrinated and misled yeah. by years and years of political myths and bullshit that benefit only the power class. That's so, a very long answer, but. Well, it sounds like you came to politics through an academic way almost. Kinda, yeah. I was not indoctrinated growing up with right. uh, anything besides just the beliefs themselves, like never knowing what they were associated with or um, what voting left or right meant or any of that. So so do you have other career highlights you can point to that have kind of led you to the uh, space you're in today? I guess. Um, so my professional origin story, um, you know, I grew up in Amy, like you said, I graduated from Amy High. I went to college at LSU where I graduated from the Manship School of Mass Communication. Uh, my bachelor's focus was in advertising with a minor in psychology. So I've always been interested in media and psychology. Um, I went on to grad school and got a master's in media management. And while I was in grad school, I interned in the marketing department of Casino Rouge and Baton Rouge. Um, and then I interned in public relations at Lucasfilm and was very fortunate to get a job in licensing at Lucasfilm after I graduated uh, from grad school. And so licensing and product development had also been an interest of mine, um, storytelling and film. Um, and as I've gotten older, my interests you know, began to change a bit as the world we lived in <laughs> began to change. So I've left Lucasfilm in 2014 to focus on my own creative projects, um, film and TV scripts, which were more story driven, but also journalism, which I feel like has become more and more important since 2016. Um, and, you know, to me, I kind of see storytelling as a fictionalized form of journalism. Like they're both concerned with getting to the truth um, at the heart of the human experience. They just go about it in very different ways. Uh, but, you know, you're never going to see a movie where the corporation is the hero and the poor people struggling to pay rent are the bad guys. Like, um, so uh, the tools of storytelling, I feel like, are, you know, uh, only help you see the real world in the proper way. Well, I just finished your book, How to Win the War on Truth. I really liked it. A couple of nuts and bolts questions I had. What made you decide to write this book now? So I guess I've been toying with the idea since 2016. It came out of so many conversations with family and friends after the election. There was just so much misinformation, which to me was pretty obvious. But the more I talked to people back home, the more I realized just how many friends and family just believe stuff that wasn't true. Crazy stuff, but also just the typical political myths that we're, you know, so indoctrinated with. So I kind of became obsessed with how to penetrate those barriers of belief. How do we help people see the bigger picture and, you know, see beyond whatever they they believe for so long and see how those beliefs are manufactured and sold to us. And so I decided, you know, the answer was equal parts, a crash course in media literacy, part psychology lesson, in part, understanding the forces of power who benefit by everything. And taken together, I hope it's a learning tool for critical thinking. So yeah, it kind of came out of 2016. And I just kept toying with the idea and playing with it and then eventually turned it into a book proposal and sold the book idea. Those things are all interwoven in there. And it's also an illustrated guide. And what? how did that come about? You know, I kind of always pictured the book illustrated because I knew there needed to be a graphic component, like the learning tool, the critical thinking tool in the book. I felt like, you know, I, you really needed a visual of that to help break things down. And so I kind of thought the book could either be like fully illustrated, like there's a great book on economics called Economics with an X. Mm -hmm. And it's like an illustrated history of economics, kind of world economics, and it's brilliant. And so that was an inspiration for the book. So I figured it could either go in that direction or uh, more like spot illustrations, like a Randall Monroe book or something. And the publisher and the agent kind of all thought Illustrated was the way to go to make it more accessible and provide, you know, a healthy dose of whimsy and humor that otherwise the dry topics you know, might not have. And I wanted it to be more fun and have a sense of irony and, and you know, kind of like political op-ed cartoons and stuff. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, so I think it worked. I yeah, It comes across, yeah. And there is a ton of data in there, a lot of charts and graphs. Uh, you don't have footnotes, but there is a huge bibliography in the back. Everything. And that's actually a small bibliography because the original one was like, the first version was 80 pages. Wow. And then, so that got trimmed to like 30 pages um, and the redundancy taken out. And so there's still a bigger bibliography on, they're supposed to put on the website, the authors. So there's like 800 sources total. Um, there's, yeah, there's so much data in that book. Um, there really is. We ran out of room to put it all in the back. 
Well, and as I told you, I got both the paperback book and the audio book. And you talked to me a little bit about because you're taking an illustrated book and making an audio book out of it. So that was quite a feat as well, right? Yeah. Well, did you, were you able to enjoy both? Um, like, did they feel uh, a little different or did they feel the same? How did you? Uh... I, I enjoyed both. And I, I, the way I approached it was I kind of went back and forth between mm -hmm. them. There were a few times when I tried to listen to the audiobook, audio book and follow it on as I was looking at the book. And you could do that. But I also kind of, when I'd be driving, I'd be listening to the book. Yeah. When I'd come home, I'd read the book. Uh, and I was trying to do this all very quickly. So that it facilitated me doing that, right? The audio book is great, by the way. I thought the narrator was really good. I haven't listened really to good. it yet, but I need, yeah, I need to. I have it. Um, I just haven't had a chance. But I tried to put a lot into the audio book that didn't make it into the book because yeah. we were. Um, and so there were, to me, I squeezed in a lot more examples um, in the audio that I wasn't able to put in the book. I um, caught that, yeah. Uh, and then, but yeah, but you lose the picture, you know, you lose all of the pictures. So I know they, um, uh, there are pictures. There's a downloadable document at the end of the audio book, right? Um, a PDF uh, with some of I the illustrations, that. I believe. I, I, the, the narrator did mention that a couple of times, but uh, I haven't been able to find uh, it. That's probably I haven't, yeah, I need to look and see which pictures ended up making it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the book, you know, was kind of engineered, well, honestly, it started out as a PowerPoint presentation, the very first draft, like to kind of teach these lessons. I was like, all right, I don't know what I'm doing with this. Maybe this is a class or a seminar or a workshop, but or maybe this is just a presentation for friends who were frustrated with other friends who believe all the bullshit. You know, why do we believe all of this bullshit? Um, and so it started out, yeah, like as a presentation. And then I turned that into a manuscript. And then I turned that into the book proposal. Then I sold the book proposal. Um, and then we had to turn the manuscript into a graphic novel script, um, which is kind of like a screenplay script, um, but with art direction for every page. You break down the panels and the pages, and then you have to um, give the artist direction on what you want to draw per panel. And then so then we got to the graphic novel script, and that took a lot of time, um, breaking things down, trying to figure out you know, which charts go where and um, how much we can squeeze in on a page. And then um, and then once the audiobook contract um, came in, then we kind of had to reverse engineer it back to a prose manuscript. Um, but this time we needed, you know, I needed the final words uh, copy from the book, which changes a lot in the editing process. Um, and then I things I had cut out, I added and then tried to describe uh, the information in the graphics for the audio um, to get the information back into, you know, Word as opposed to charts. And so- um, It works, it works yeah. by the way, it worked really well. Yeah, good, no, I'm glad to hear that. I, uh, I yeah, I wanna listen to the audio book and I had to, re we rearranged a few things in the audio book, um, but because again, without the pictures, I felt like, you know, the order needed to shift a little bit. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but overall, yeah, it was a, a, a lot of work, several years in the making, and I'm very excited to be able to share it with people I, now. I can bear, there's so much information in there, I can believe it took a long time to do. Let's get into the info you share, because it all is right. meaty, so we obviously can't cover it all, and why would we want to? Because people should buy the book, but you start with the story of hot coffee which I think mm -hmm. was fascinating. There's a great documentary about that that I actually will also put in the uh, episode notes when I post this. But this story is about the elderly woman. That, almost everybody's heard of the story about the elderly woman that bought coffee at McDonald's and burned herself. And the way that was packaged and sold to the public veers crazily off from what that story really is. I, everybody thought that that was probably the perfect example to start the book with because you know, I, to this day, every single person has the wrong impression of the co the hot coffee story that I've talked to, you know, f friends, family, everyone. Yeah, it's not a left right thing. No, it's not a left right thing. It's and I remember I, I remember when it happened like a little um, or I remember us talking about it in college at the time and um, and didn't know much about it. But again, it was more just the joke like, oh, somebody spills hot coffee. And, um, you know, so we all as a society yeah i think we you know we have this impression of what it is and it's just so not the real story um it's the the spin that mcdonald's sold us um 
And it was part of a bigger movement um, not to get rid of um, questionable lawsuits, but to excuse corporate uh, behavior, um, you know, to for corporations that manufacture hazardous products or sloppy um, uh, sales that they get out of paying money in lawsuits. Um, and that's what it was really about. And, you know, and that's why the coffee uh, example is such a, um, so indicative of the bigger picture. Um, yeah, we believe things that serve only the wealthiest of corporations um, and the little man is screwed. Um, yeah. yeah, the documentary is great. That documentary is, I, I highly recommend it. I think it's called Hot Coffee. It is called Hot Coffee. And the thing about that is it really goes into how we've ended up with the judiciary system we've ended up with. Yeah. So it's a really good documentary. Very corporate. I, yeah. I, and people, I, when people see those images, they're not the highest quality images, but you can find the pictures online of Stella Livax, uh, the burnt, um, the pictures of her burns, and they are just um, eye opening. I mean, they're, they're scary looking. I don't think I remembered from the documentary, it might be in there, but you mentioned how they had already been sued multiple times just because they kept their coffee at this excruciatingly such a high temperature. High temperature. Yeah, they, like, why didn't yeah. they just put the temperature down? It's so bizarre. I, I, yeah, I don't know either, but yeah, they had paid out like 800, um, they were like 800 incidents or things they had to pay out. And I don't know why they didn't. Um, it just makes, I don't know if it's just like a corporate behemoth and they, you know, like, um, until they have to really pay money, like <laughs> they don't change their ways. Um, that's usually, you know, it usually takes government intervention, regulation, um, or a lawsuit before companies correct course. Um, even when doing so would be very easy. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, but right. There's no reason the coffee had to be as scalding hot as a car's radiator. Like, I, yeah, it makes no sense because even a Keurig or home brewing is not near that hot. You give a lot of great history, a lot of great political history lessons in this book. Interestingly, there's this fella named Bernays that comes up a lot uh, related to Sigmund Freud, right? Yeah, yeah, Freud's nephew. Well, tell us who he is. And I want to know, is he a villain in the war on truth? Uh, you know, even Bernays had like some standards, but like, I mean, yeah, Bernays really was, I guess, America's, you know, the grandfather of uh, American PR. Um, you know, he, Freud, uh, you know, was kind of the grandfather of psychology or psychoanalysis. And um, Bernays, his nephew, applied those insights into you know, modern public relations, advertising, marketing, um, basically selling the people stuff um, that they either didn't need or um, selling us ideas that weren't acceptable at the time. And so he really kind of started, um, you know, the modern advertising industry. Um, and, you know, he definitely sold us stuff we didn't need, like getting women to smoke cigarettes um, at a time when only men smoked. Um, and, yeah, his writings, you know, are about manipulating the public. I don't think he saw it as manipulating the public for evil. <laughs> um, I think he saw it as influencing public opinion so that, you know, we buy stuff. Um, and, you know, it definitely worked. We, you know, buy all kinds of stuff, even when we think advertising doesn't work um, or we think it's obvious. It's not always that obvious. Um, so Bernays really pioneered you know, publicity stunts. He pioneered celebrity endorsements. He um, uh, even like influencing um, like regulation and stuff. Like when women uh, start, started cutting their hair in the 20s, um, the hairnet industry was losing money. So if women weren't buying hairnets because they had long hair, what else, why else could we sell hairnets? And so he convinced you know, health officials to require hair nets to keep hair out of food. So even manipulating, you know, uh, the government in that way to sell product, you know. Um, and so, yeah, so it, it's kind of crazy, but his tactics have just gotten so, um, uh, in, have become so insidious when you have bad political actors and misinformation outlets and 
and propaganda outlets um, that do nothing but manipulate the people. Um, and so, so whereas Benet's was kind of more benign, I feel like today a lot of the political lies are way closer to Adolf Hitler and his minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. You know, um, what was their, their, his main three directives was stuff like, you know, manipulate, appeal to negative emotions, direct anger at an adversary, and repeat the falsehoods. And like, that's all you're getting right now um, mm -hmm. from Fox News, from a lot of, um, you know, websites that claim to be news. I mean, everything from Infowars to Breitbart, um, you know, they adhere very closely to Nazi propaganda tactics. Um, you know, and the lies are kind of the first start. Um, um, selling lies is truth, repeating lies enough um, where people believe them. Um, you know, that's the road to fascism. That's kind of how we got fascism. Well, and you also talk a lot, in addition to politics and history, you talk a lot about, as you mentioned, psychological ideas like heuristics and priming mm -hmm. how do those mm -hmm. play a part in this an implicit bias um yeah you know priming i uh you know the welfare the welfare abuse uh myth comes to mind because you know growing up in the south um it's you know it's a real racial belief and so if you know you hear this belief in the south that minorities abuse the welfare system you know, like that's priming. And so if you grow up hearing that, then that's all you're ever going to notice. You're going to notice minorities who seem to be abusing the system, whether they are or not. And you fail to notice all of the white people on welfare, which is the vast majority of welfare recipients. Um, and you fail to notice welfare helping people survive and helping um, people escape poverty and feeding the hungry. Like, all the other narratives that are part of, you know, the, a social safety net gets ignored um, if you're only primed with that one narrow, you know, oh, there's abuse. And there's really not, like, I have the percentage in the book, but even back during the welfare queen heyday, you know, when all these lies were being promoted, like welfare abuse was like 1% or something, you know, like it was nothing. Um, they're way uh, bigger uh, problems than that. It's minuscule, you know, um, uh, people, people mooching off welfare is minuscule. Um, but if we're primed to notice it, then we think it's bigger than it is. And so, you know, a lot of the political lies these days, you know, the first time you hear them, that's priming. And then every time you hear it, that's a confirmation bias. Um, and so you, you know, eventually you believe it's true. Um, even if it's not, it's just that, uh, uh, I, I mentioned in the book, the availability heuristic. Like, again, if you hear what, the word welfare, you may, your mind may immediately go to welfare abuse or someone abusing the system. And that's just an example of the availability heuristic where um, we think of whatever the most readily available narrative that we've heard repeated, regardless of if it's true, accurate, um, or complete falsehood. And you talk about how emotion and repetition really play a role in propaganda. Yeah, emotion is so important. Emotional awareness. Yeah, I kind of feel like uh, um, emotional awareness, emotional intelligence, and psychology, I feel like should be a part of school curriculums from the time where, you know, we go to kindergarten or first grade till we graduate. Um, because the self-awareness that we lack, um, that you really only get if you go to therapy or if you read psychology, um, you just never become self-aware of um, your emotional reactions, the emotional undercurrent to a lot of our choices or decisions. Um, uh, you know, there are studies that show that emotional intelligence is more important to success and life satisfaction than regular intelligence, than IQ. Um, and so one of the biggest ways that we can become aware is recognizing uh, recognizing and labeling our emotions and especially the negative emotions, you know, not just when someone pisses us off or um, not just in controlling our own reactions to life, but um, noticing when politicians and pundits are trying to negatively arouse us either by making us angry at some type of outgroup or um, 
minority group or making us spiteful about certain people, um, any negative emotion that is um, directed towards a group of people who are not in our own tribe um, is usually, you know, a very uh, clear indication of manipulation. And that's all you get from some of these right-wing media outlets these days. So it occurred to me pretty much all advertising and political messaging is spin. When does it cross from spin into propaganda? I get to me. Well, I feel like spin is kind of just, it's kind of just another name. What I am trying to figure out what we should call the book titles and uh, stuff. Spin seemed to be the nineties terminology for okay. Propaganda, like okay, okay. the books, like so many of the books had spin in the title and even through the early 2000s. And then um, and then the, you know, the terminology kind of changes. And then by the Trump years, it was post-truth. And gotcha. so I feel like they're always kind of describing the same thing. I feel like propaganda is kind of the umbrella term for all of the bullshit, whether it's um, lies, misinformation, falsehoods. And, you know, they all have small differences. I, I guess I, I think of spin as traditionally um, someone, you know, uh, putting, God, I'm trying to think of how you define spin without using so, the word spin. Right. Yeah. So like, I think of it as trying to put your message in the best light and try to. Yes. Put, that's a great way. Try, that's a great definition. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, that's what I think of it too. You think of it more as a reactionary oh, this fact is, fact has come to light and now you need to spin it in such a way that it doesn't look badly on you. Um, but that's not even what happens anymore. Now it's just straight denial of the fact and it's just lies, you know? Because um, even when these, uh, you know, like so many of the politicians that condemn January 6th, mm -hmm. now they're not, I, you know, it's even less spinning it and more just denying they said that or denying um, it's just a whole nother level. Um, it's just flat out lies a lot mm -hmm. of the times um, or misinformation or whatever you want to call it. You talk about in the book, and this is I hear this on social media all the time, people talking about the fairness doctrine, people yeah. on both the left and the right bemoan that it doesn't exist anymore, but they seem to bemoan it for different reasons. And I'm wondering, would that even work today or would it become a vehicle for both siderism and false equivalencies? Yeah, I don't know what's what's unique or well, what's interesting about the fairness doctrine. And for those that don't know, you know, you were our network news was supposed to provide two sides to hot topics. So if a political pundit came on um, and was talking about one side of an issue, then you would have the other party talking about um, you know, the other side of it. And, you know, and they didn't, what's unique about the, about that fairness doctrine is that it never had to be enforced. Network news actually adhered to it and they were pretty, um, fair in how they handled things that they didn't really need it. And so when they tried to put it into law, proper law, um, the Reagan administration killed it. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with so much goes back to Nixon. <laughs> like It's amazing how much in our modern climate goes back to Nixon. But one of the things that came out of the Nixon White House was um, they thought Watergate was a PR problem. Um, they thought, you know, we think of Watergate as, no, this is corruption. This is, you know, Watergate happened. He took responsibility. He left office. Eh, not exactly. His administration thought it was a PR problem. Um, and so when you have all of the major news outlets covering Watergate in a very fair and balanced way, um, and you don't have a network to spin it, you know, you didn't have any spin places, um, you know, the, the journalist, the journalism bar um, was worked like it was supposed to, um, and he eventually had to leave office. And so the idea was that if the right wing could have a media outlet, then they could keep another Nixon from being impeached. And Roger Ailes had his handprints on this. A lot of the political consultants of yesteryear who were the same as today are still around. Um, you know, they had this idea and that ultimately became Fox News. So when the fairness doctrine was struck down, 
the first thing that happened was right-wing radio. So radio wasn't that partisan. And so the first thing that came out of the late 80s was right-wing radio. And the right dwarfs the left on the radio by 10 to 1. And so what you had was all these very partisan, ideologically driven uh, right-wing outlets that came up like Rush Limbaugh. And it wasn't, and you know, and Rush Limbaugh was to me pure propaganda. Um, I mean, it was a lot of hate speech, Mm -hmm. but what is he doing? He's making the listeners angry. He's directing their angry, their anger at people um, on the other team or whoever it may be. Um, And he was really nasty about it. I mean, he was such a bully. Um, And, you know, he made them angry. He directed their anger and he repeated the bullshit constantly. And so one of the, some of the books I've read, um, a lot of that, that kind of the homegrown militia movement mm-hmm. came out of right wing radio. Cause you know, you have these people during the eighties, all they had was anti-government sent- sentiment, you know? So during the eighties, it was, you know, Reagan's, uh, government's not the solution. Government is the problem. So you had, you know, a decade of all this anti-government sentiment. Then you have right wing radio now which is brainwashing people into thinking the government's coming for your guns, the government is evil and bad. And then when Clinton got into the White House, it just amped that rhetoric up even more. And so you had all of these disastrous, you know, uh, militia movements, like things that were happening in the 90s. And today's, you know, uh, anti-government, Proud Boys, Oath Keeper, like all of that is is just a further growth of that movement that started um you know it's egged on by right-wing radio now that's expanded into uh, the internet and fox news and so you have this complete alternate reality um and even in early as what was it 2008 that like the bush administration the department of homeland security said that the the greatest threat uh the greatest terrorist threat in America is not Muslims or immigrants. It is lone wolf, right wing, white extremist men um, who basically been brainwashed. Um, and you saw the culmination of that in January 6th. Um, and so it's just so much bigger than it has ever been before. And I honestly don't think you would have any of that without, you know, uh, right-wing radio and tv and internet you know it's uh without anyone selling those ideas um you know you don't have paul pelosi being knocked out with a hammer um but you know that they you know they i heard this i don't know who said it i've read so much it's hard to remember now um but someone basically said they speak the hate into existence Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i think that's completely true um you if know. there's if there's a Louisiana lefty listener who has not yet watched the documentary, The Brainwashing of My Dad, that's another doc. I highly it's recommend. It's a great one. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, the the dangers of Fox News can be overstated um, because people think it's news um, mm-hmm. and it's not. It was never designed to be news. It was designed to... Um, basically indoctrinate people with a pro-business right-wing agenda. Um, and, uh, and you know, the, those, even in studies, you know, uh, by experts who study communication methods, um, those that are viewed as left-wing media adhere to the tenets of journalism most of the time. Um, and those that are viewed as right-wing uh, are a little more than propaganda outlets. Well, so that brings me to this question, and you answered this a little bit when you talked about your political origin story. Mm-hmm. But as I'm reading the book, it to me seems like it has a liberal slant to it. And is that because truth has a liberal bias, as that saying goes, or were you tailoring this for a specific audience? I wasn't tailoring it, and we actually had discussions. Um, I, I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, so, so this question is so, like, there's so many answers to it. <laughs> you know, the first is when we hear the words liberal bias, again, that's another branding, you know, this message that's sold to us 
from right. the Nixon White House. It was it literally liberal media came from uh, like military propagandists in the Nixon White House um, that did not like the news coverage Nixon was getting on the news. So if they could smear the media as having a bias, um, then they would look at Nixon more favorable. Um, and so I was thinking about this recently, though, like if if it looks if the news looks like it has a liberal bias, it's because the job of the media is to hold the powerful accountable, you know, speak truth to power and hold the powerful accountable. And propaganda comes from the powerful and that originates on the right. So if you know, like what I like, I, an example I like to use is um, like the book isn't necessarily, well, let me step back. The book I, isn't. To, first, I just want to say that's a really great answer. <laughs> that's oh, a really you. good answer. Well, and I, I don't even feel like it hit on what I'm really thinking, but like, so the, the book is not selectively elevating right wing propaganda and ignoring left wing propaganda, but tracing how propaganda has predominantly been a function of power structures and power structures are right wing by definition. Um, you know, the church and the aristocracy and the monarchy and the corporations and Nazi Germany. Um, and so with that power, speaking truth to power, if power is usually right, then it looks left. And the power people have to say that, oh, that's just left because that's the only way they can deny it or, you know, they can't, if you're speaking truth to power, the power can't speak truth back. They have to smear whoever's speaking truth to power. And, um, you know, there was another, like, I, this is an example I was going to say earlier, another one I use, like, you know, it's so easy to dismiss news stories that powerful people don't like. Um, and no one complains about Fox News because it has a conservative bias. If we're complaining about Fox News, we're complaining about it because they're lying, they're spreading misinformation. We're arguing the facts, basically. Um, but if the right is smearing the left, they're not arguing the facts. They're just saying, oh, or they're liberal bias, or oh, it's this. And so because of the way the two sides are arguing, that should tell you everything you need to know. Um, and you know, liberal and conservative is such emotionally charged labels. I feel like it's it's better to look at an example. So I like to use this example from the past. Let's imagine you're running a newspaper, an American newspaper in the 1860s or something. Okay. You decide to profile um, a family that's that are slaves on a plantation. So your job as the news, as the journalist, is to show the people what life is like. You know, what is it that the slave family goes through? And the male of the family has been severely beaten. You know, he can barely walk. The female has been raped by the white slave master multiple times and has children of his that he doesn't claim. So let's say, you know, this story depicts a grim but accurate representation of slave life. So um, naturally, the slave master is going to be pissed. <laughs> so you run that story. That story is true. Um, the slave master demands that you tell his side of the story. So what is his side of the story? It's the, all the allegations are false. The workers are well taken care of. We love them just like family. You know, do you run that story? If all he is doing is trying to maintain power. So your story is speaking truth to power. That is why you're running it. You're not running it because it's liberal. You're not running it because it's a left wing um, agenda. You're running it because this is journalism exposing the truth that other people do not want shown the light of day. And so, you know, is that a liberal versus conservative point of view? Technically, if you look at the definitions, I guess it is because, you know, liberal is basically just defined as favoring progress or reform and protecting the rights of the individual and governmental guarantees of liberty. Whereas conservatism is defined by preserving existing conditions, institutions, and power structures and res restoring traditional ones, i.e. limiting change. And so if you look at things as those two forces, then yeah, technically I guess it would have a liberal bias, but it's also just reality. And so 
you know, I, so yeah, the liberal, the terms liberal and conservative to me are just so, um, you know, they use them as labels, but because of branding and bullshit and PR, I feel like they mean different things in the collective consciousness. Whereas when you go to the dictionary examples, it makes it very clear. One of those sides are usually fighting for things that are trying to make the world a more equal place. Mm -hmm. And the other is trying to resist that. That's and, very helpful. That's very helpful framing. Yeah. A long answer, but yeah. Um, no, but it's really helpful. Well, so we talked in the pre-interview video that we did that'll be on Facebook and YouTube about Elon Musk buying Twitter. And I feel like he poses a danger to the platform, but because there's so much journalism and reporters, media on the platform, I, I think that in particular is a, is a danger as well. Whereas he professes to be a free speech absolutist, he's discovering that's not the easiest thing, particularly when he has such a fragile ego. In the book, you talked about censorship through noise. And mm -hmm. I found that to be an interesting concept too. I don't think I'd ever heard of that before, but I, I see some of that, I feel like on Twitter, where it's just... Yeah. It's almost another way of flooding the zone, right? Yeah. But well, and that's basically what Steve Bannon, you know, uh, what a lot I heard. It was through a political scientist, I think, in a book where I read about that, and I think the the term was created to um, describe what was happening. I think in um, like the Middle East or these other countries, where if the dictator or whoever you know, if bad information surfaces about them in the public sphere or online, um, instead of denying it, they just flood the zone with all of this noise to, you know, focus the hate on someone else, make up stories, distract. Um, and because of the internet, you can do that. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, if you only had uh, traditional media, you know, that couldn't happen. Um, and so the opportunities for this noise uh, are so vast. And that's what we see happening with election lies in January 6th. And, I, you know, there's just so much noise. Um, and how does that result in censorship? Like, how does it end up Oh, there? because uh, basically censorship through noise, if, if there's only one truth teller, <laughs> but thousands of bullshitters, then the truth teller doesn't stand a chance. Um, because in the marketplace of ideas, you know, all the bullshit is, uh, more heavily subsidized. So, um, so it's basically just overpowering, uh, the truth tellers with bullshit. And, you know, that's kind of, I guess what, um, what may be happening on Twitter if, you know, depending on who gets a voice and who doesn't. Well, we spoke earlier this season to someone from the Biden administration that's mm -hmm. helping with Biden and Harris's big push to make sure everyone in the country has broadband. And we thought of the internet as being this great democratizer and in getting information to all these people. But I have a lot of people asking me these days, is social media a problem? Is it a direct threat to the truth? Is it a direct threat to democracy? What do you think about that? I, I mean, I think so, um, but not, I mean, partly because, yeah, it democratizes who can have a voice online. Um, and so that gives lots of people a voice that may not have one. But what it also does is enable bad actors to go hog wild with bullshit. Um, and, you know, like yeah, that is hard to control. But what they can control are the algorithms that show us this stuff. <clears throat> and it's the algorithms more than the medium that is the problem. Um, uh, you know, I talk in the book, uh, Barbara F. Walter, House of a War Start, I quote her. It's just a great book if you haven't read it. Um, but basically she tracks the decline of democracy across the globe to the Facebook algorithm um, you know, that it was like 2011 is when they instituted the new algorithm that instead of showing everything from your peers or whatever, um, whatever you click on and respond to the most, it's going to send you stuff in that direction. And the more it sends you, YouTube does this too, um, then the more extreme 
is the content it's you know sending you. So if you get angry over something and you spread that, then the algorithm knows, oh, send them more angry stuff that makes them angry like that. And so you're just, you know, you're they're looking for that emotional response because that guarantees you share it and you get angry um, and it's manipulation. Um, and then so you're just going to keep going down that rabbit hole. So before long, you know, you are in that rabbit hole and you're only getting these um, posts that make you more extreme. Um, and that's one of the biggest problems um, because the, I, you know, I think the vast majority of the of Facebook posts now are more crap than news. You know, it's, it's the lies, the distortions, like the, the most posted, because again, those have the highest level of engagement because they're making you pissed or angry at somebody. And it's how a lot of those January 6th insurrectionists found one another is. Right. Well, and it, all... you know, and it totally, it puts you in an echo chamber because if that's the only thing you're getting in your feeds are more lies, <laughs> then you don't, you know, like, I, I mean, in a way, you know, I mean, yeah, you should have critical thinking enough to know that this is bullshit. But at the same time, if everywhere you're getting your information is the same message, then the fault's really lying with the handful of bad actors that are that spend their lives <laughs> brainwashing you. And I think that's what we have going on right now, um, you know, with the Republican Party. Uh, it's not just that the voters are clueless and have been misled by years of propaganda and all the modern lies of the internet age, but that you have a very small group of bad actors at the top that know they're full of shit, that know the people they're selling it to are gonna buy it and won't know any better. You know, they're, they're just, the people are more Machiavellian mm -hmm. and they know how to manipulate people and that's what they're doing. Um, and I don't know how they stop until something bad happens. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I feel like until a Paul Pelosi is murdered. We come, um, we're, and we're, we're actually, come close, right? We've come close. close. And I don't even know if that would do it. Because even seeing the response to what happened to Paul Pelosi, it's appalling. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing mm -hmm. how they're justifying this 80-year-old getting beaten with a hammer and a fractured skull is just more fodder for the propaganda mill. And I, yeah, I, I think of it a lot like the 60s. Think of how many people had to be assassinated before things calmed down. Um, and the 60s was a more clean, clear cut. I mean, it was basically black people wanting the same rights as white people and white people being so been out of shape about it, they kept killing people. <laughs> like, I mean, you really want to put the 60s in the simplest of terms, like that's kind of what happened. You know, Martin Luther King was assassinated, JFK was assassinated. I mean, you look at all of these people who basically just stood for peace and equality, um, you know, shot down because of white racism and white racists. And um, I mean, the police, the violence, the protests, the, you know, I mean, in a word, racism is mm -hmm. what it all was. White people not wanting black people to be able to vote. So in your last chapter, we are starting to talk about what we do about this. Yeah. One of the things I, if I understood you correctly, you propose that to be better consumers of information, we should focus less on what we believe and more on our core values. Yeah. Um, Adam Grant is another writer who writes about that. And a lot of times the reasons that it's hard to change our opinions and our beliefs is because they're tied to, um, you know, uh, a tribe or a political party. Um, and instead of, you know, being tied to these beliefs, um, we should be more motivated by our values. So what's important to us? Is it equality? Is it um, whatever the value is, honesty, trust, um, uh, you know, charity, taking care of the poor, and then adjust our stances or our alignment to reflect the values that are important to us. Um, and yeah, that's one of the best ways we can, um, yeah, clarify our values and who really embodies that. Um, 
or who embodies that by their policies, if we're talking about politics. Um, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, I just feel like uh, only, um, I, the, I, well, you know, I'll say one more thing on that. The, the, the thing about values is they're usually positive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, they're a positive value and a positive emotion. And so if we're led by that, then, um, then I think that would go a long way to helping people vote in the right way. Because if we're voting by negative emotions, punishing a group, you know, a minority, um, whatever it is, if we're led by a negative emotion, welfare fraud, um, anti-immigrant sentiment, uh, uh, keeping taxes low, like the emotion that underpins those are more negative. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and that's usually a sign we're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think one of the, um, you know, like fiscal res responsibility, um, or keeping taxes low, I feel like is such a, uh, it's the driving factor by so much of our voting habits, for, at least for one side. But, you know, what, what I like to point out to friends is, you know, what is the emotional value that undercuts that? So like, what is it that drives you to vote to keep your taxes low or to be fiscally responsible? Um, what is the emotion that underscores that? And what would the opposite um, party be voting for in the other direction, which is what a robust social safety net? Um, right. That's why we want to spend more tax dollars. Um, and what is the emotional value that underscores that? And, you know, that's charity or concern for the less fortunate or making sure people aren't falling through the cracks of society. Right. And so if you're voting for that, then you're moved to vote uh, for a positive value. You're not moved to vote for a negative value. And the opposite negative value of that would be self-interest or greed if you're voting only to keep your taxes low. Um, like there's no other way to, you know, it's, that's the difference. Um, and so why are some people voting for self-interest and other people are motivated to vote for the other thing? Um, and so are you motivated to vote by positive values or are you motivated by negative values? Um, and to become aware of that and really consider what that means. Um, who's benefiting by each of those. Okay. So is individual responsibility the only way for us to win the war on truth? And, and, and by that, I mean, taking responsibility for our own media consumption and information consumption, or is there a way for us to help our family and neighbors reset how they take in information? Well, you know, you could block Fox news on their TV <laughs> with the child controls or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, we definitely have to be responsible, but what I hope the book does is enable people to understand why their friends and family think the way they do and are voting the way they do so that it may provide a better blueprint on how to show them um, how they're misled or why they're misled. Um, I think the answer is probably a little different for each person, depending on what's really driving someone's uh, bias or motivation or whatever. Um, but even more important than individual, I think we have to hold the powerful people accountable. Um, you know, we need Facebook to freaking moderate and do a better job. We need accountability for mediums that lie, like uh, Alex Jones. Um, the decision was definitely in the right direction, but. Um, but if you have Tucker Carlson or you have these people that are spewing hate speech and a violent act happens because of it, which, you know, we don't have a strong history of, um, of fighting legally in this country, but I think that needs to change. I think you have got to have accountability. If you have that loud of a megaphone and the words you're spewing incite hate and violence, then you have got to be held accountable because that is the 
legal accountability is the only way you're going to get all of these mini gerbils to <laughs> stop. Like, I, I don't know what else the solution is. I, you know, like fairness doctrine would be nice, but I don't think it's very realistic. I think accountability um, for what people say uh, in positions of power. Um, like, a, you know, and is there any better example than January 6th? You ask all of those people that have been held accountable, you know, why did they do what they did? Everyone has said the same thing. My president told me to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so the ideas have to come from somewhere. Uh, the footmen may be carrying out the, the bad deeds, but someone's planning the ideas in their head. Well, and you've mentioned that you speak to friends and family and, and try to interact on these issues. And I, I do think that's got to remain part of the equation because right now, while we're working towards trying to get accountability, there's people trying to block that accountability from happening. But, yeah. you know, a couple of stories. Uh, Tim Ryan told the story the other day that a mayor from Ohio City stopped him and said, I, I really need you to win. You've got to win because I need to stop hating my neighbors. And that's a, a really interesting framing for where yeah. we are politically. I personally have a story where, because I've been hearing about other people on in the media talking about trying to speak to folks who are really bought into these conspiracy, QAnon conspiracies and whatnot. And I have a doctor who helps me out a great deal, but is very bought into the MAGA conspiracy theories. And I engaged in conversation the other day just to dip my toe in the water. And I thought, you know, Linda, this is insane of you. Like, this is going to go nowhere. You're not changing this person's mind. But the thing that I found on the other side of the conversation is they at least said to me, well, I can have a conversation with you. And you were able to speak to me rationally and, and calmly and kindly without putting me down. And I thought, well, at least I walk away from that guy with him thinking that's a Democrat, that's a liberal. That's not a demon. That's a human. Yeah. And I think that's part of where some of this has to keep. We have to keep yeah. that going. Um, yeah, no, I agree. It's just, uh, yeah, there's just so much hate speech and demonizing going on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because it's not just that you know, the conspiracy theories are, it, you know, it's not that people are believing in aliens visiting or something apolitical. It's that the conspiracy theories are directed at vulnerable people. Right. Um, and to someone's benefit. And so the division it sows, um, you know, in society at large is just dangerous. And that's why it's it's closer to like, you know, Nazi Germany, um, because this is what basically, you know, they were doing to direct anger at the Jews, except here it's well, hell, it's at the Jews here, too. But right. Um, these days, um, as well as immigrants, immigrants, you know, were the scapegoat for in 2016. Um, but uh, but whatever the group is, if it's a vulnerable group. They don't have power. And so when these people stir up hatred and conspiracy theories and lies, um, you know, there's nothing easier in the world than just to hate somebody who's different. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, you know, uh, if people in power um, or our leaders or people with megaphones are getting us to do that, that's just super dangerous. And so we have to resist it um, and we have to hold them accountable for spewing hate speech. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's the ones with power and a voice that really need to be held accountable for what they're disseminating. Is there anything else besides the book that you're working on right now that you want people to know about? Um, at the moment, it's just the book. I don't think I have, I'd be working on a few that's other quite, projects. That's quite a lot. Yeah. It's very, it's very clear. You put a lot of time, a lot. <laughs> time into that book. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I'm glad you enjoyed it and, uh, highly recommend. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you listened to the audiobook as well. Cause that's really great to hear. Well, let me get to the last three questions. I ask okay. a version of every episode. And I think I want to ask you what you think our biggest obstacle for truth is right now. The biggest obstacle for truth, again, is partisan media to me. Um, okay. Uh, I think partisan media 
it's really hard with such a megaphone, you know, um, no amount of clearing up the message is going to work if the partisan outlet never clears up the message. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so that's why I think you just say you have to hold them accountable. Um, I think that's the that's the most dangerous to me. Um, the biggest megaphones um, that do not correct themselves, um, uh, I think is the biggest problem because um, there is just so much bullshit. Um, but to a degree, I think you can ignore the online bullshit if it never reaches the bigger outlets. But at the moment, those bigger outlets are amplifying the bullshit in the smaller outlets um, because, you know, it fits their agenda. Um, and, you know, and Fo you know, Fox News is, it exists to make money, but to spin a corporate, you know, their agenda. Um, and if making the viewer angry and hate someone um, is good for business, <laughs> then they're going to keep doing it. Um, and that's what that business model has proven. Um, there's a really good book I'll leave viewers with. Foxocracy is fantastic, written by uh, Tobin Smith, I think. I could be wrong. Um, but somebody who was on the inside and really talks about the marketing strategy and the business strategy and behind the scenes look. It's a fascinating book. Um, but basically, like they know exactly what material will incite the audience. They know how many retweets and views they'll get when they post stuff to social media. Um, they know which guests get the most um, feedback from viewers. And like, I mean, it's, it really is a science and a business mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, uh, that's there to make people angry and make the, um, uh, the machine more profitable. That's a very dark business model. Yeah. Uh, what's our yeah, what's our biggest opportunity for a truth? One thing about the right is they're really good at selling a certain narrative. And the left is not always good with supplying a counter narrative or more importantly, clearing up that narrative. Um, and I guess, you know, the one I'm thinking about at the moment is about like inflation. When I see some of the politicians on the news being interviewed about inflation and they keep trying to tie it back to voting for the stimulus checks and i see that and i'm and but the public the person they're interviewing about it is not clearing up that miss you know that misbelief i mean the stimulus checks did not cause inflation inflation is caused by corporate greed and other factors but primarily corporate greed and then those measly stimulus checks from two years ago when everybody was unemployed and couldn't pay rent <laughs> did not cause inflation and so I feel like, you know, correcting the misinformation, but putting it in the right context. Like the entire world right now is experiencing inflation. And our measly stimulus checks from two years ago is not causing inflation in third world countries. Like, I mean, it's just stupid and ludicrous. And the fact that these people being interviewed can't put out what we're going through in the broader context, um, it just like baffles me. Um, like we're not, it's not like, you know, we're in this alone. And a lot of times in the news and in politics, it seems like, it, like, like other countries haven't had to deal with these issues before. Like, you know, we're the first person to ever have this argument. And I feel like you can pretty much kill that argument by just telling what every other country has done to fix this problem. <laughs> and we don't ever do. Um, but inflation for the moment is the big one. And no one's talking about how corporations are at a, six, a 70 year high with profits. Like, I mean, inflation's at a 50 year high, but corporate profits are at a 70 year high. And price markups used to be like 30% 50 years ago, 30% of a product's cost was markup. And now it's over 60%. Um, and like, you know, these are facts that explain inflation and arguing whether or not someone should have voted on the stimulus two years ago is just ridiculous. Um, I think anyways. Katie Porter's the only one I hear making your case there on inflation. I yeah, well, and Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, they're a handful, but they're the outliers is right. what's so ridiculous. Robert Reich, I follow, and he's just brilliant. And I feel like he's spot on the money, but, you know, he's not necessarily um, someone they have on, you know, CNN discussing things. Um, 
which they should, because he's a former labor secretary and he is an economist and this is what he does for a living. So instead we're interviewing two political pundits right. that don't have the answer. They're just, they have their party spiel um, and some are worse than others, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, we need, they need better representatives out in the media correcting the lies and misinformation, and it needs to be a party platform and not just on an individual basis. I feel like that's an opportunity that there just seem to be lacking, um, you know, selling the truth. <laughs> okay. And Sam, who's your favorite superhero? Uh, I think Wolverine. I like Wolverine. He's one of my fallback uh, Halloween costumes, so I'm going to go with him. I love that. You're the first Wolverine we've had. That's I love oh, really? getting. I, I love getting the new superheroes. What's the most popular one you get? I get Black Panther a lot and Wonder Woman a lot. Well, that makes sense because their movies are. Uh, you know, we're we're currently in a cycle where sure. their movies have a little more prominence. So. Well, and a lot of women grew up as young girls. Wonder Woman was the one that you saw, right? That was the True. person you saw that you could kind of look up to. But you're right, Black Panther is very. And, yeah, of the moment. And yeah. look, but it's also had such a huge impact. Uh, the the MCU version of that has had such a, mm. a big impact on on how folks have framed how they they view yeah. their own culture. So I think that's been a big one. But yeah. anyway, I so much appreciate your taking the time to speak with me today. I love the book, and I hope people will buy the book and read it because I think it's a really important uh, work for people to check out. Thank you. I appreciate you having me, and I hope we didn't go too uh, far over. Thank you for listening to Louisiana Lefty. Please follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you to Ben Collinsworth for producing Louisiana Lefty, Jen Pack of Black Cat Studios for our Super Lefty artwork, and Thousand Dollar Car for allowing us to use their Swamp Pop Classic Security Guard as our Louisiana Lefty theme song.